Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, let's get started. It's an exciting subject, uh, an exciting uh, new area of uh, policy reflection. Uh, and to help us uh, reflect uh, on this area, we've got an excellent panel. Uh, the panel reminds me of the, uh, the different dimensions of the issue uh, that are being looked at in Geneva as part of a discussion on lethal autonomous weapon systems uh, in a convention called the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which is an instrument that sits at the conjunction of international humanitarian law uh, and uh, arms control. Uh, we have uh, a uniformed participant, General, welcome to the panel. Uh, we have uh, uh, legal and ethical expertise uh, on the panel, Hugo, who represents the ICRC. Uh, and we have two outstanding technical experts, uh, 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 Lydia and Elsa. Uh, and we will look at all these dimensions as we unfold the complexities uh, of uh, uh, this uh, field. Now, what is the problem that we are dealing with? Uh, Warfare over the centuries has shifted in response to shifts in technology. Uh, each new technological rev revolution, whether it's nuclear weapons uh, or uh, precision-guided munitions, uh, has uh, uh, affected the way war is conducted, affected uh, notions of uh, stability, uh, and has often raised questions about uh, control and compliance with international humanitarian law. What's different about artificial intelligence and autonomous systems, and we'll put those two together in this panel, uh, is that there is the prospect of the weapon fusing with the wielder. Uh, so far in, in uh, the history of conflict, these two have been separate, but there is a real concern that these two might fuse together. So then who does IHL apply to? Who, uh, who do uh, the norms of warfare apply to and how? Uh, and can we trust uh, the battlefield more and more uh, to uh, machines? In the Geneva discussions, uh, the first formal meeting was uh, last year. We looked at these various dimensions of the issue. Uh, and we came up with a set of conclusions and recommendations that would allow us to focus more on, uh, let me put it this way, three and a half points uh, this year. Uh, the first is the characterization of the systems. How do we define these systems? Uh, do we reach far back into legacy automated systems such as uh, precision-guided munitions, uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles, or we stretch ourselves far into the future and look at Terminator, Iron Man type of scenarios. I think we are choosing to be realistic, so we will look at various aspects of the issue and try and define what is it that we should be uh, concerned about. The second aspect, and this is a very important consideration uh, for both uh, the uniformed community and the legal ethical community, and that's the human machine interface. So what are the various touch points where humans and machines come together? from the area of design of such systems to their actual deployment on the battlefield. Uh, can the commander maintain control over these systems? Can we ensure that they, uh, they use complies with uh, IHL? The third aspect that we look at is the various international security and humanitarian law challenges that the deployment of these systems uh, could pose. Uh, one of the questions that they raise is uh, stability. We have used to looking at we are used to looking at strategic stability from the context of nuclear weapons and long range uh, missiles. Uh, now, what happens when such systems are fielded? Can they uh, affect strategic stability in a negative way? Uh, could there be uh, a deterrence equations between uh, countries that field uh, such a system? So these are open questions, and there are other questions about uh, termination. Uh, of uh, war, uh, about uh, crisis stability, uh, arms race uh, stability, uh, the diffusion of such technologies to non-state actors. You can just imagine uh, a suicide bomber just has to Uber a bomb 
uh, to a target, doesn't have to go himself or herself. So there are uh, these considerations that are uh, coming up. So we'll unpack uh, those uh, issues uh, uh, as well. Uh, one other aspect as we look at the technology side of the equation is that these are uh, uh, innovations uh, that cut across the traditional uh, dual use divide. These are multiple use, these are ubiquitous. Uh, and it's hard to really, I mean, to, to lawyers, humanitarian lawyers and disarmament and arms control diplomats used to counting things, uh, looking at discrete separations between civilian and military objects, uh, looking at X number of tanks and bombs and so on. Uh, these, are, these are not uh, uh, discrete systems, uh, and they seep across the entire uh, military planning, execution, uh, training uh, uh, spectrum. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get uh, started. And I just want to throw out a few questions to our uh, excellent uh, panelists. Uh, and as they go through their pre presentation, they'll try and answer some of these questions, and then we'll have an interactive discussion uh, to follow up on that, and we'll invite some questions uh, from uh, the uh, audience. So some of the questions that I request you uh, to reflect on in your uh, remarks uh, is that how do we uh, maintain uh, the uh, civilian applications of, the growing civilian applications of uh, AI while protecting the hard-won uh, tenets of international humanitarian law and respecting the legitimate security and commercial interests of both states and the industry. Uh, in the military domain, what are the challenges that will likely arise from increasing autonomy and decreasing space for human intervention in conflict? And here, I think there are a number of drivers that are often missed out on. Uh, the, the increasing cognitive and physical load on soldiers, uh, the increasing tempo of warfare, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, in certain uh, uh, training scenarios are better delivered uh, without uh, physical training and, and so on. So I'd request some of the panelists to look at those drivers for the use of AI in military, uh, in, uh, military systems. And what are the ways in which robotic warfare will evolve in both cluttered and uncluttered environments? Some people think that we can draw lines around, let's say, the maritime uh, domain uh, and deploy uh, autonomous, uh, fully autonomous systems there and protect the rest of the battle space from that. So can we draw those kind of separations? Uh, and how will the deployment of such systems affect stability in its various forms? As I mentioned, strategic stability, crisis stability, and arms race stability, and finally, how can global institution and treaties such as the CCW manage uh, this new evolution of warfare. So let me turn now to Lydia. Lydia, take us forward. Thank you. Namaskar. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. This is my first time to India, and I know it's not going to be my last. So the theme of this conference uh, is managing disruptive transitions. And we're seeing a lot of developments in a wave of disruptive technologies. And I want to go over just a few of them real quick. Artificial intelligence is something that uh, Ambassador Jill already mentioned, but there's also nanotechnology, additive printing, robotics, bioinformatics, quantum computing, DNA editing, and even brain-computer interface. These, are te these technologies have dual civilian and military applications. Coincidentally, the character of war is also experiencing some changes, particularly in the operating environment with new technologies being incorporated in it. The U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command has offered the multi-domain battle concept, which captures these changes well. Before the battle space was understood and organized in time, geographic space, and by war fighting domain. So, for example, land, air, sea, space, and cyber. Time was understood to be a period in which the conflict started and ended. And geography had its own unique problem sets and were to be addressed within the particular area of that geography. In this sense, a domain was contested in a certain geographic space during a certain period of time. Now, all domains are contested all the time. Geographic space is truly no longer one geography at a time fight. The battle space has expanded and there is more data than before and less time to understand, process, and fuse it into actionable intelligence. The effects of cyberspace, electromagnetic warfare, and information increase the, the role that super-empowered individuals and groups can play. In addition, we have more proxies. 
we have surrogates. All of this adds to the actor complexity. But I would argue that potentially the greatest complexity is that conflict is now occurring almost exclusively below the threshold of war. So where do disruptive technologies fit in? The Internet of Things is not just for our smart homes, our smart farms, and our smart cities. It is also for the military. With increasing military Internet of Things inside an ecosystem, we have unmanned autonomous aerial and underwater vehicles becoming part of the connected family, sensors also feeding in data, automated systems communicating with other machines and making decisions, and artificial intelligence providing decision support to commanders and soldiers alike. Which, by the way, make no mistake, the more that we rely on artificial intelligence to support our decisions, the more it will become a decision support infrastructure. And we're going to have to be very careful that it is not hacked or compromised, whether it be the data or the machine learning environment. The nucleus of all of these moving parts will be in the combat cloud. So what about AI and robotics? Lately, there's been a lot of interest in lethal autonomous weapon systems and sensationalist speculation of its widespread use and the dangers of uncontrollable AI. While there has been an increase in new technologies and we are already operating at a higher tempo, this does not mean that commanders have increased their risk appetite in the battle space to use unpredictable weapons. And this is because the bottom line hasn't changed. Commanders are still responsible for mission success. This is something that gets lost in the sensationalist conversation. Depending on the circumstance, um, robotic autonomy may not be the preferred choice as it would be ineffective to use unmanned autonomous systems too far away from friendly force protection and communication because they can be jammed or rendered useless through the use of electronic warfare. This goes back to mission assurance and achieving the effects the commander wants. Sometimes the desired effect can be achieved with someone walking into a building and plugging a USB in a system. No need for AI drones. However, autonomous systems that operate in cyberspace may pose a greater concern when unintended second and third order effects take place at the speed of cyber. The employment of these technologies will depend on a commander's trust in the system to reliably operate as expected. For now, this remains an elusive, exotic um, type of weapon. And the final message I would like to leave you with is that the technological advances are happening at an exponential rate. And uh, we talk about experts, and I, I wonder how you can be an expert when everything changes every week. So I can say that I am an expert at trying to manage all that new information every single week. So there are ways in which we know that technologies are going to be employed. But there are also unpredictable creative ways in which these technologies are going to converge together that we do not know yet. So I believe that the best way to address these challenges is to practice feeling comfortable with the unknown or just uncomfortable all the time. Both methods work well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Lydia. Thank you. Really appreciate that uh, crisp uh, start to uh, our uh, discussion. And to continue that, uh, may I ask Elsa to uh, come in? And if you can expand uh, this uh, new notion of uh, a seamless battle space, but draw in uh, some of the other players. There are eight or 10 upstream players uh, in this field, the United States, uh, China, uh, Israel, Germany, uh, France, uh, Russia, uh, the UK, uh, and perhaps India. So if you can expand this a bit and take it to uh, uh, its next uh, logical level. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and I've really enjoyed the fascinating conversations over the past several days. Uh, today's disruptive technologies could catalyze disruptive transitions both in the character of conflict and the balance of power. My remarks this evening will focus on the military dimension of the AI revolution, informed by my research on Chinese defense and military innovation, and then I'll address some of the potential adverse implications for strategic stability. Increasingly, it's clear that AI has emerged as a new focus of international competition, against the backdrop of intensifying great power rivalry. Memorably, Putin has declared that AI is the future for all humankind, warning whoever leads in AI will become the ruler of the world. China has articulated its ambition to emerge as the world's premier AI innovation center and even lead the world in AI by 2030. The new US national security strategy Two highlights that the U.S. will prioritize emerging technologies that are critical to security to maintain its competitive advantage. 
Meanwhile, India has also convened an AI task force to help leverage AI to advance its economic transformation, and, India, and Israel remains a pioneer in the field as well. Despite these indicators of intense competition at the national level, it's uh, critical to remember, of course, that there is extensive global engagement and cooperation among AI researchers and enterprises. And uh, since the private sector has taken the lead as the primary engine for innovation, advances in AI are, are also likely to diffuse rapidly, and it may prove infeasible for any single actor to achieve a decisive advantage. At the same time, AI is expected to change paradigms of military power, transforming the character of conflict, and the trajectory of the AI revolution could disrupt current military and strategic balances of power, and uh, as such, it's hardly surprising that there are such active efforts to advance these military applications. In particular, the US and China alike have prioritized AI within their respective defense innovation agenda. Although technological advantage has been a key pillar of US military leadership, China is clearly catching up, emerging as an AI powerhouse, and Chinese leaders prioritize AI at the highest levels, seeking to advance their country's comprehensive national power and military capabilities. Going forward, uh, to build upon uh, Lydia's comments on AI and on the future battle space, there clearly will be a wide range of military applications of AI and national defense far beyond uh, autonomous weapons alone. Within the near term, we could see AI enhance information processing and intelligence analysis. For instance, the US Department of Defense recently announced that Project MAVEN, the algorithmic warfare cross-functional team, has already deployed algorithms in the fight against ISIS for the analysis of massive amounts of data and imagery from drones. In parallel, there have been a series of US and Chinese demonstrations of, of advances in swarming. In a conflict scenario, swarms of hundreds perhaps even thousands of drones could be used to saturate high-value high weapons platforms like aircraft carriers, a scenario actually depicted in China's military museum. Within the foreseeable future, AI could also transform conflict in the information domain with greater automation of cyber weapons, advances in cognitive electronic warfare, and big data-driven psychological warfare. In subtler and supporting functions as well, AI will enhance logistics and precision maintenance and will have utility in wargaming and simulations. For instance, uh, given its lack of recent combat experience, the Chinese military intends to use AI technologies along with virtual and augmented reality to enhance the realism and sophistication of its training. Beyond these and other notable applications, uh, to raise an even more fundamental question, what is the future of human command and control on the battlefield? With AlphaGo's historic defeat of Li Sedol in the game of Go, Chinese strategists started to recognize the potential of, of AI to create innovative tactics and stratagems that can surpass even the most brilliant of human contenders. Some have even suggested that military commanders should similarly leverage AI to achieve decision su superiority. Certain Chinese defense academics have even contemplated the potential for a singularity in warfare a point at which the human mind might become unable to keep pace with the speed and complexity of future combat, necessitating that AI systems take on a greater role in command decision making with humans in more of a supervisory capacity. Of course, warfare is not a game of go, but rather is and will remain a very human endeavor of immense complexity, and its nature, particularly as a political instrument, will not change. In historical perspective, it's also worth recalling that attempts to predict the future of warfare have been very imperfect at best, and the AI revolution we're now seeing could be transformative in ways we can't yet imagine. However, it's fair to say that we can expect that as the character of conflict continues to evolve, there will be divergences in how different militaries and non-state actors em employ these technologies. At a basic level, military organizations will vary in their capacity to leverage AI, including due to new challenges for human factors, training, and even issues of sharing data across organizational boundaries. The US military has reaffirmed its commitment to keeping humans in the loop on future autonomous weapon systems, and there are robust debates emerging involving the legal and ethical issues that might arise. However, at this point, it is less clear how China, Russia, and other actors might approach these issues. 
Although the progress of the UNGGE to date is clearly important and encouraging, there are some reasons for skepticism about the prospects for states agreeing upon and adhering to legal and normative frameworks for the use of technologies and capabilities that could be so strategic and are advancing far more rapidly than the pace of diplomacy. Nonetheless, I hope that there is potential for future engagement among major militaries on options to mitigate potential operational risks that could undermine crisis stability or even endanger strategic stability. The pursuit of military advantage through AI creates not only capabilities but also new vulnerabilities that could exacerbate the risks of momentum-driven escalation, particularly in the cyber domain. There is inherent risk in reliance upon complex, automated systems in which errors and malfunctions are not only probable, but probably inevitable. AI systems can also be vulnerable to cyber threats and adversary exploitation that could corrupt data or fool algorithms. For instance, could errors in algorithms used to inform intelligence exacerbate misperceptions in a crisis scenario through misinforming key decision makers? Could emergent, unexpected interactions among military use algorithms cause a flash crash, like those that resulted from algorithmic trading in financial markets, that could trigger inadvertent and controllable escalation? Despite uh, considerable disagreements on the future of the liberal international order, uh, great powers still share at least a basic commitment to strategic stability and recognize the undesirability of unintended conflict. Hopefully, this can serve as a starting point for future engagement on options for pragmatic parameters, perhaps including fail-safes, so commitment to robust testing and redundancies in sensitive systems to mitigate these risks. Clearly, the future trajectory of these technologies is uncertain, but the future of warfare will be determined by today's choices. Thank you very much, Elsa. And please applaud her contribution. Uh, I think you've underlined the chameleon-like nature of uh, this technology. It's ever-changing. Uh, today's AI is uh, tomorrow's software. Uh, so how does IHL cope up with these kind of technologies? And Hugo would, will help us uh, uh, examine that question. And as an ethicist, uh, um, uh, as a thinker on ethics, he uh, might also help us answer the questions that kind of straddle the military and civilian domain. So if on the one hand we have this concern of, about stability, about loss of uh, command and control, uh, and errors propagating through autonomous systems on the military side, on the civilian side, uh, does predictive analytics uh, overtake the, the due processes that uh, democracies are used to? Uh, uh, do autonomous uh, cars make our uh, uh, a life uh, more difficult in some ways. So those are the issues that ethicists and even um, uh, lawmakers across the world are struggling uh, with. So Hugo, please take us through all those. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure for the ICRC to address the Ricina Dialogue. And we're grateful to India, particularly for your work, Ambassador, on the group of experts on this issue. Um, I, I want to start by saying the ICRC feels there is real urgency on this issue. We've been hearing that there's exponential change going on. These weapons are already in some forms being used. We think it's very important we concentrate on the weapons that are being used now or about to be used rather than imagining a distant future and getting diverted that way. Therefore, we're urging states very much and we're grateful for the support of India on this to really bring governments together now to agree rules, principles, and if it's necessary to start developing international humanitarian law to cover the issues of these weapons. And ICRC's concern on this question and these weapons is the same as our concern is always. Um, as the guardians of international humanitarian law, we have two main concerns. We want to make sure that all new weapons are compatible with international humanitarian law. And we also want to make sure that all new weapons avoid humanitarian consequences as much as possible. So I'm going to set the scene briefly and then talk about three aspects, as um, the ambassador said. I'm going to talk about legal aspects, the operational principles that we think need to be in place, and some ethical aspects. 
So if we set the scene now, we're aware in the ICRC of about 90 states who already have drone capability, um, about 28 states who have armed drone capability, and probably nine states who are actively using this capability. And of course, we're also aware of non-state armed groups who are weaponizing commercial drones for their effect. So we see this as something we need to really get to grips with now. And if I start with the legal aspect, IHL and autonomous weapons. In Article 36 of the Additional Protocol 1, and I wouldn't be ICRC if I didn't quote from the conventions, um, it's quite clear that any new weapon must be designed with the ability to respect IHL, to respect the law, and be capable of operating with those laws. And that means that any of these weapons must be able to operate in line with the three main principles of IHL, which of course are distinction, proportionality, and precaution. So any of these new weapons needs to be capable to make judgments about distinction, proportionality, and precaution on the battlefields. And we feel that that kind of judgment, certainly at this point in time, really needs human control. And IHL also requires a direct link between the decisions and intentions of commanders and the outcomes of an attack. So we feel strongly that new principles that governments need to come together to agree must focus primarily on human control over the critical functions of these machines. And by critical functions, we mean the, the ability, the functions which can target and attack. And the reason that this is so important is also because it is not machines which are accountable to IHL. It is not machines that have to be law-abiding. It is humans who are accountable to IHL, and it is humans who have responsibilities, both state and individual obligations under IHL. <clears throat> so I want to turn now to operating principles as we're beginning to see them emerge. And this means that the crux of this whole question, and every panelist has said this so far, the crux of these questions around autonomous weapons and AI is a question of relationship the relationship between humans and machines, the relationship between the human and the machine. And in our view, this needs human control over the critical functions of the machine. And therefore, we're recommending three principles to start um, state discussions and really push in this area. The first is the predictability of the machine. The second is the reliability of the machine. And the third is human supervision and the ability to intervene after activation. Now, happily at the moment, if we, if we look around, we see that this is mostly the case in these weapons at the moment. They do have human supervision. They do have humans in the loop. I want to finish by thinking about the ethical aspects of, of this. And there is a lot of public anxiety about these weapons. And that is a good sign, because very often when we feel uncomfortable about something morally, that is an important prompt of what the Martins Clause in IHL calls the public conscience. And we have to respect that public conscience. People all over the world are saying there's something that worries us about these, these weapons, there's something that is troubling. And when I was preparing to come to Raisina and come to India and, and talk um, here, I went back and I read the great spiritual text of the Bhagavad Gita. And that, of course, is a text which starts in a moment of war. And there were two incidents that leapt out at me when I read the text again. And the first one, of course, is the famous incident of the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, when the great warrior Arjuna, <clears throat> that both armies are lined up, and he leads his chariot out and sits in his chariot in the middle, and he looks in front of him at the opposing army, and he sees fathers, brothers, sons, teachers, grandfathers. And he's overcome by compassion. And he's a great bowman, Arjun. And his bow drops from his hand. And his mind reels. Now, it seems to me that that is an important moment of autonomous humanitarian pause 
And that is crucial to human beings and to human control. Can we rely on those weapons to have moments of autonomous human, humanitarian pause? And the second thing, after he's decided to fight, or been persuaded by Krishna, of course, he, he then, there's a huge battle, and he comes across Bhishma. Now, Bhishma is the greatest of all warriors, and he has been made inviolable. He cannot be killed and destroyed, except at the moment when he chooses. That is the gift they gave him. And at a certain point in that battle, at the height of the battle, when he's covered in arrows and pierced all over, he decides that the moment has come. And he decides to turn his mind from war, and he decides to die. And therefore, that is a moment, if you like, of an autonomous humanitarian deactivation. How can we rely on these weapons to have that ability to have a humanitarian deactivation? So those are the questions I think are ethically posed. And our, our autonomy is precious, and we don't want to give it away too easily. And under law, we cannot give it away. So we have to, in our view, find a way to keep human control over these critical functions of these machines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugo. And thank you for bringing up the Mahabharata example, uh, which uh, showcases uh, uh, a fully autonomous weapon system, the Sudarshan Chakra. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it could only be trusted to a god. Uh, exactly. And even there we had, I think, one possible uh, uh, flirting with the IHL red lines with the use of that weapon in uh, Mahabharata. Um, I think uh, you, you've raised very important issues uh, of uh, what is a system uh, that we should be concerned about? And you focus your concern on systems that acquire and engage uh, targets without uh, human uh, supervision. And so as we turn to uh, our last speaker for uh, the initial remarks, in general, I think that's a good starting point. Because UK is one of the, to my knowledge, three countries that has put out a doctrine in the public domain what is the UK's understanding of what uh, is a system of concern, uh, the, uh, like the US DOD uh, doctrine. Uh, so uh, tell us about that. And also, because uh, we've heard a lot of concern about the deployment of these systems. As a military man, do you think there is some benefit in deploying these systems? For example, less collateral da damage, uh, more discrimination in terms of choosing uh, and engaging uh, targets. Uh, uh, better force protection, are there some benefits? Uh, and uh, what do you think are the drivers uh, that are pushing militaries to, uh, to deploy uh, AI and AI systems uh, in uh, uh, military uh, uh, hardware and software? Over to you. Thank you, Ambassador, and, uh, and good evening to you all. I'm, I'm uh, really grateful for this opportunity to, to speak um, uh, in particular to the ORF and to Samir, um, not least because it shows that I am forgiven um, for my illness yesterday, which um, prevented me speaking on the panel on counterterrorism, which I was looking forward to doing. So I got this opportunity uh, to join this distinguished panel um, this evening, uh, and it is a subject you know, that, that should be um, close to all our hearts. It is a subject... Um, whose implications we're only starting to understand. Uh, it crosses military and, and um, the, the, the military sector and the private sector um, uh, in very interesting and, and, and challenging ways. So it's a very topical um, panel to join. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful. This is my second attendance at the Rasina conference or dialogue. Um, and um, it just seems to me to go from strength to strength, a real... Um, sense of momentum, uh, it, it strikes me coming here this year. So um, I, I congratulate the, the organizers um, uh, in that respect. I think there's an awful lot you could say about this subject. I think my fellow panelists have, have, uh, have really said some profound things, um, very interesting things about uh, the area. Um, but let me come at it from a, a kind of soldierly perspective. So the first thing to say is that um, I am an advocate in the UK Armed Forces for innovation. 
And it seems to me uh, that um, innovation, there's a great potential for innovation in the disciplines that I collectively call mill tech. And in, in, in coining that term, uh, which I stole from fintech, um, I, I mean the disciplines of things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, autonomy and robotics, data an analysis and visualization, um, modeling and simulation, behavioral sciences. Th these all go together, um, uh, to my mind, uh, under, the, under a heading mill tech, i.e. how do we how might we apply these technologies which are making a big difference in other walks of life in the military sphere. And I think the headline is that from, from where I sit, you know, even if we wanted to, there isn't a cat's chance in the hell of us kind of shutting off this area and saying none of us are going to go there. You know, that isn't going to happen. What we do need to happen is we think very thoughtfully about the questions that have been so far raised, and I'm sure will, will come from uh, your questions and answers, and that we therefore regulate and, and manage uh, the issues in, in the best possible way um, to achieve the greatest effect. But, but the chances of us sitting King uh, Canute-like and resisting the onset of the flow of the tide, um, I think, are, are zero. These technologies, uh, uh, it's rather like you know, having the idea that we might um, have looked at the aircraft a hundred years ago and said, you know, we're all going to agree that it has no application in, in warfare. You know, that was never going to happen. So, you know, why, why is that so? Well, I mean, at a headline level, I think um, we can see a massive impact in the civil sector from these technologies and, and disciplines. Um, and it's not immediately obvious why those, those benefits, and I'll come to risks in a minute as well, why those benefits um, wouldn't uh, be deliverable as well in the military sphere. Um, it isn't a very big leaf of faith um, to, sit, to see the same kind of benefits in the military space that are um, now perceivable in, in the um, civilian sector. It follows, I think, that we need to think deeply about it. You know, so, so you know, I start from a premise of wanting to um, make use of these technologies to deliver advantage, um, but we need to um, tr uh, try and think through all the implications of so doing. And I'm honestly of the view that we are only just starting to scratch the surface of this. There are implications to come that we cannot currently see. Um, and what that you know, implies to me is that we must engage in a dialogue. Uh, it may change over time. Uh, we certainly can't afford to sort of sit around and wait for 15 years while the implications become clear to us. But equally well, we need to be um, agile and adaptive over time as, as the full um, implications of these technologies hit us. The kind of benefits that uh, I see accruing from a military perspective um, are fairly obvious, I, I suspect, but I will just mention a couple of them. Um, there, there is a real potential for um, the reduction in the consumption of manpower for tasks um, that can be automated. Um, since manpower is a premium um, to greater or lesser degrees for all of us, military manpower, um, reducing that manpower burden is um, very attractive. It also obviously reduces our operating costs. It would also reduce our capital costs. You know, um, potentially, um, some of these systems uh, may achieve, for a fraction of the investment, um, very disproportionate benefit. I, I said that we would reduce the number of, potentially reduce the number of people we need in the military space through these technologies, but it also follows that we potentially reduce the risk to our military people through these technologies. And as a commander of, of, of soldiers, you know, why wouldn't I want to be in a position uh, in which the men and women I command are, are potentially removed from risk or the risk to them is reduced? So it's very attractive from that perspective. But potentially it also um, improves the effectiveness of the mission. And here I would say there is a danger of us gliding from the term artificial intelligence to um, uh, the term you know, autonomous weapons. 
Um, artificial intelligence is going to play a role uh, much wider than in weaponry. Uh, and and we, we, we particularly need to be thoughtful and careful about it in the application of it to weaponry. Um, but it can be really considerable benefit, for example, in understanding. Um, uh, and, you know, there is tremendous, you mentioned Project Maven, one of you did. Um, uh, it was you, wasn't it? The, 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 um, you know, the, the, the potential for, for these technologies to have an impact outside the weaponry space are, are very considerable and potentially beneficial. But even in the space of platforms, you know, if you are able to um, operate a drone, for example, uh, you can operate it um, for, for longer, you can fly lower, um, uh, you can fly slower because you, you, you're no longer worrying about people putting people at risk and therefore you can do a better job. So, you, so it improves the effectiveness of your mission. Of course, there are also potential risks um, and they've been touched on by, I think, all the members of the panel. That there is, of course, the potential for uh, illegal use, uh, indiscriminate use, um, as exists for any weapon system, frankly. Um, but I, I think it's noteworthy that the um, UN Special Rapporteur on the protection of human rights whilst engaging in counterterrorism said in 2013 that if used in compliance, and I stress that, if used in compliance, um, these technologies were capable of reducing the risk of civilian casualties. Um, you know, so I say this slightly tongue-in-cheek, but not completely. You know, people sometimes talk about the, the prohibition of these technologies. I think we should entertain the notion that at some point in the future, the mandation of these technologies, uh, in some respects, m may be required because they may potentially, eventually, be self-evidently more discriminatory rather than less. Another risk that people often talk about is that um, uh, the operator, by being separate from the machine and not at the, say, exposed to the same risk, uh, will become divorced from that reality. You know, essentially, to paraphrase, trigger happy because I'm no longer at risk myself. You know, all, all I can say there is, you know, that's absolutely not my experience. You know, I have talked to the crews of people who operate um, uh, the Reaper system in the UK, which is an um, unmanned air system. Um, they uh, operate very remotely from, from the battlefield, but they um, spend long periods of time essentially in the battle space by virtue of uh, observing it. Um, they, you know, unlike actually soldiers like me who, who might have been involved in um, conflict where essentially the attack happened, the, the incident took place, and quite quickly you're moving on and going somewhere else, very often these, these crews are responsible for doing um, the assessment afterwards. So they're very conscious of the effect of what they're doing. Um, and I don't see that danger of um, divorcing the uh, individual from reality quite so strongly as I think other people do. There is also, um, you know, the risk of, of lowering the threshold of conflict. It, the idea that because you're no longer put, putting human lives at risk, that you're more willing to uh, engage in conflict. And I do agree that um, the theoretical possibility of that does exist. Although I think, um, you know, so far, I don't think we've seen much evidence of that. So, I mean, those are the gains, you know, and some of the gains, some of the risks. Um, you know, it's crucial that we mitigate them over time. And um, so the UK policy um, is one in which we uh, stress the need for transparency and compliance with the legal, moral, and ethical principles that uphold the legitimacy of the employment of force. For example, um, Hugo mentioned Article 36 of the Additional Protocol 1 of the Geneva Convention, which the UK ratified in 1998. Um, it's also our policy that unmanned systems are always under human control as an absolute guarantee of human oversight, authority, and crucially, as Hugo mentioned, accountability for weapon usage. We don't possess fully autonomous uh, armed uh, weapon systems, and we've no intention of doing so. So in sum, um, 
with regard to conflicts, rights, and the machine, and evolving um, methods for, of warfare, uh, which is the title of our, of our panel, uh, the UK Armed Forces are pursuing new data-driven digital capabilities because we uh, believe they offer significant uh, advantage. But we also recognize the necessity to think carefully uh, about these capabilities and to ensure that they are used, sorry, that in using them, uh, we remain compliant with our obligations under international law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being very disciplined. General, perhaps it's your presence <laughs> on the panel. That's, so we have uh, uh, eight minutes for uh, questions. Uh, I had some questions for the panelists for the second round, but I think let's open it up and let's uh, get some questions from the uh, the audience, and as is the Raisina tradition, we start with the uh, Raisina Young Fellows, uh, and the first on my list is uh, Felix, Felix Conry. You have the floor, Felix. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Felix from the UK. Um, you've spoken about how the, um, the evolving means of warfare um, could affect the threshold for, for the start of conflict, and also the character, the nature of, of warfare or conflict as it happens, um, how might the evolving means of warfare also affect um, what is considered to be a successful war and, and therefore perhaps why you might end, an or, end, end a war? Right. Okay. Good one. Let's take another one before we uh, go back to the panel. Uh, Zena, Zena Jalab. Hi, this is Zena from Palestine. Um, while, uh, thank you for this uh, panel. Um, in your intervention, uh, you've talked about um, uh, technology and uh, warfare technology and the possible ways how it might be uh, a tool to scratch um, to scratch the surface and treat certain symptoms. But I don't really think that um, it can get to the roots of the problem and provide answers and solutions for the inherent roots of the problem. We can look at the example of the Middle East, Iraq, ISIS, and all of what's happening. What we see now, we see mostly a decline in civility and increase in hostility. It, warfare, it really managed to Increase the contrib and contribute to the um, increased feelings of disenfranchisement, marginalization, and alienation of people. My question is how can we, as a human, bear the responsibility to shift paradigms, to get at, um, to get at the roots of the problem, and help people search for their identities? Thank you. Thank you, Zena. Perhaps we can take one more question on uh, that side. Uh, please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Please Hello, introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, good evening to all. I'm Carl Jason. Uh, and my question to Mr. Hugo Slim. Uh, sir, we know that nuclear disarmament has been a very hard sell given how countries always have the option of developing new destabilizing technology in warfare under the pretext of national security. So my question really is, do you, I mean, do you see the regulation and proliferation of AI technology uh, going to be a difficult proposition considering how um, you know, it said log it, it, you know, the fundamental principles of international law, it said loggerheads with, um, you know, uh, this regulation. Uh, because you know that there's national sovereignty and uh, national security which are enshrined in some of uh, the international law aspects. Thank, thank you very much. So, three very good questions. The utilitarian aspect of AI, uh, the exactly the opposite aspect of AI, lowering the threshold of use of force, putting civilians in the harm's way and lessons from the nuclear domain in terms of international regulation, uh, international treaties. To that, if you can also, Hugo and General, if you can look at uh, the ICRC is defining uh, these systems uh, in a, in a uh, preliminary manner. I mean, there's no final definition yet. So autonomous weapon uh, systems. And you mentioned uh, fully autonomous uh, armed system. So uh, is there a, an issue of setting the bar too low, setting the bar too high? Where do we find the, uh, the, the balance? Uh, and then this aspect of the uh, human-machine interface. Uh, you mentioned Article 36 reviews. Do our other panelists think that there are other aspects 
uh, in terms of the technology governance of it, uh, where we can better handle the uh, human-machine interface. Because frankly, there are only about a dozen countries that do weapons reviews, and these are like black boxes. We don't know much about them. So maybe a minute and some seconds for each uh, panelist. Can we start with you, Hugo? OK. Um, Felix, thank you. I'll answer half of your question if I can very briefly. I'm not going to answer what makes a successful war. I don't think ICR should be sort of talking about what victory should look like and everything. On the threshold issue, I mean, I, I take what the general said. The ICRC has no illusions about human control. Um, we've been dealing with human control over weapons for 150 years, and humans can be incredibly brutal and violate IHL as much as they respect it when they are in full control. So I think there is a possibility in terms of threshold that we could see some improvements in conduct from um, these kind of weapons in certain cases. So you know, we are realistic and open to that in terms of thresholds. Um, Zina, your question on roots and identity is a really big one. I, I'm not sure I can go into the root problems and how people can find their identity. Um, but, you know, it's something we all care about, obviously. On um, the question about the nuclear ban, and do we think it's a, a difficult proposition to deal with these proliferating, developing weapons? Yes, we think it's a very difficult proposition. That's why, I mean, in fact, I was glad to hear the general say, we think people, the states need to start now, even if it's going to be incremental steps constantly, as, as both our speakers from academia have said, it's going to change all the time. It's going to be a very difficult proposition, and we need to start and be ready to change as we go. Um, but getting respect for IHL, frankly, is always a difficult proposition. Um, so that's not something new in the field. In terms of definitions, just... Um, on, the, on the fully autonomous, autonomous thing, I mean, our view is that we don't want to call them fully autonomous weapons because, as I said, we want humans to be accountable for them under law. So we want autonomous weapons with human control in them, and then we can um, have that principle of, of accountability to the human, not the machine. Right. Let's continue. Elsa, please, final thoughts on what the the discussion and you want to react to some of the other panelists? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you all for your questions and it's been a really fascinating discussion so far. I think certainly we're seeing uh, it's a fascinating time to be looking at these issues given these convergences of disruptive transition and, and disruptive technologies at a time of great power rivalries and I'd, even as we're seeing the character of conflict start to evolve in unique and unpredictable ways to the ambassador's point I think it's important to remember that warfare will remain a human endeavor, and the human element of the, of the machine age of warfare will remain equally vital and also pose new challenges. So mm -hmm. with regard to human factors, for instance, so tremendous changes for militaries, thinking about how to train and ensure that their personnel are a understand, these, understand these new systems, are able to operate them effectively, are able to mitigate risks of automation bias, the, risks of compromised decision making that could result from reliance upon technology. And I think that going forward, certainly I remain hopeful that there can be progress given a sh shared recognition of the risks to crisis stability and strategic stability in, in looking towards pr pragmatic, pr pragma pragmatic parameters to mitigate some of the threats and to ensure that developments occur in compliance with legal and ethical frameworks. I think it'll also be uh, important to look beyond the topic of the panel, mm -hmm. beyond warfare itself, and recognize, as a colleague Lydia mentioned, that the boundaries between peace and warfare are blurring, the boundaries between military and civilian technologies are blurring, and AI will hopefully create tremendous opportunities for development, for transformation, and hopefully in ways that can empower individuals, but also could empower states. Mm -hmm. And so certainly, I've been fast. Thanks again for the questions and fascinating discussion. And yeah, I think that's a very good note to wrap up our discussion on. We, uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time. A uh, lot of applications, a lot of potential in terms of AI. There are some concerns, and it's only through uh, careful uh, uh, work at all levels of governance, uh, international, national, and at the level of industry, uh, that we'll be able to tackle uh, those concerns. So please join me in thanking our uh, panelists for this fascinating discussion.